Hello, everybody, and welcome to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and this week we are tackling a bit of a taboo topic in the limited community. We're talking constructed magic. And before I scare you off, before you turn off the podcast, we're going to be talking about the ways that constructed can make you a better limited player, and also some tips for onboarding to constructed if you're a limited player looking to dip your toe in. I could not do this episode alone, so we have a guest joining us today, Jonathan Nonfelt. You might know him in the limited community as Fyodor Sasha. He's pretty active in limited discords and on Twitch. We've actually been planning this episode for quite a while, trying to figure out a spot to fit it in into the limited content release cycle. And here we are. Jonathan is someone who has made that leap from being solely a limited player to a player who does play constructed and has had good competitive success. So my friend, How's it going? Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's uh, it's all good. It's fun to actually do this episode after talking about it for so long. I'm really excited for this because uh, this this is this is one of my favorite topics to compare compare limited and constructed because there there are similarities and uh, lessons you can you can take from both sides. Yeah. So just before we get into like the actual nitty gritty of the topic, as we got just leading into the show here, um, I think it'd be cool just for you to tell your story of how you went from the limited player to becoming a constructive player. Like what did that look like? What pushed you to do that? Where, how did you find enjoyment out of this format that, you know, the joke for a lot of limited players is just like, I'm never going to touch that with a 10 foot pole, but that wasn't you. That was, you made that transition. Yeah. I, I, start, I started out, like that as well like I, I started out playing limited and i considered myself limited only like mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to touch constructed i didn't think it was very interested i just wanted to play limited in the beginning but then there were like thing that started was that i realized after drafting at my local game store uh, a bunch of times is that i had a lot of the cards and there were some events that other people that i knew at the game store were gonna uh, we're going to play my first standard deck. Uh, we had a standard tournament. Uh, I played a mono red goblins deck because, well, I like aggro decks. So I built a somewhat janky goblin deck with uh, experimental frenzy, uh, runaway steamkin and uh, skirt prospector were all legal. And I thought nice. it was super cool. Runaway steamkin was one of my favorite cards as well as experimental frenzy. So it, it was a cool first step to make that transition uh, with two of my favorite cards from draft. I think that is a very good starting point, uh, like looking at your favorite cards from a limited set and see, do these work in constructed and kind of go from there. Yeah, and that's kind of the way that I engage with constructed these days too. Like it might be kind of funny to hear this coming from me, the you know, the limited guy, but uh I started playing constructed before I started playing limited, which I think a lot of players do as well. Like back in Turn to Ravnica Standard, my first deck that I really played a lot, took to tournaments was like blue white control with the sphinx's revelation and some pre-verdict and all that yeah. and then i got into limited and I, I stopped playing constructed but now these days when i do fire up a standard deck or a pioneer deck or something it's a lot of times inspired by the limited sets i'll give you an example i brewed like this green white artifact deck after playing Brothers War, where that was a theme, like Green White cares about artifacts with, you know, the Teething Wormlet and the, the Green White Uncommon, like puts a, art, a counter on your stuff whenever you play an artifact. And like, yeah. that was a deck that I just like kind of, you know, played a bit and it worked pretty well, but that was inspired by Limited. And I actually know Sam Black, who's kind of another master of both domains, good at Limited and Constructed. That's how he likes to build Constructed decks too. He takes like the best things he likes about Limited decks and applies them in a more constructed context. So I think that's a really good entry point, yeah. Yeah, and 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 also looking at your play style your or your play preference from Limited when you're like looking for a way to approach Constructed as well. Like I've always been fond of aggro decks. Boros is my go-to archetype uh, at my local game store. Uh, it's the joke that I'm the Boros guy. Like <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to draft Boros if if it's good and if I can. Uh, I'm going to draft it. I'm going to play it. I'm going to be the aggro deck uh, in the pod. Uh, and I've transferred that over into Constructed as well. Yeah, and I think that a lot of players who might be thinking of jumping to construct or you know when i say you know by the way when i say i'm jumping jumping to construct and you're somebody who made the jump to construct it it's not like you don't play limited i'm not saying like you anybody should jump and play complete yeah. different format not play limited it's just you can do it in tandem and especially these days with arena it, you're you're kind of incentivized to play constructed as a limited player too because you've got all these wild cards you've got 
a bunch of resources that you can use that will get you more gold, let you draft more. So honestly, a good reason in my mind to play constructed is just to supplement your limited so you don't have to pay as much yeah. for each draft, right? That like who needs a better reason than that? Yeah, exactly. Like I I could build basically any constructed deck in, on arena right now. Like yeah. any standard deck cost me cost me nothing to build because I already had drafted all the cards. I have a complete set of everything uh, that I would need for standard. Uh, and so it's also a great way to just test out any and all decks that you would be interested in. That was not a thing when I first got into constructed. Like I I would have to really look at deck lists and maybe find some obscure uh, brewing YouTube video that someone had played something similar, scour the the internet for deck lists. You know now you can just if you if you have a good collection you can maybe at the cost of a couple of wild cards you can try ba basically any deck uh, that you would like and if you don't like it well you. Sp you spent essentially nothing, so uh, it's a very low cost, low cost investment, if you if you want to try your hand at specifically standard, uh, and I think standard is pretty good at the moment actually. Yeah. Um, so I, I really uh, I really recommend doing it that way. You really don't have uh, much of a barrier of investment, at least when it comes to arena, if you draft a lot on there. Yeah, this past weekend, I, I just played a Ravnica Remastered Team Sealed event, and we ended up making it to the top four. Our team made it to the top four, which qualifies all for an upcoming RC, uh, the regional qualifier championship, which is in Montreal. So this is in May, coming up in a few months. And I was like, do I want to play this constructed standard event? And I was kind of on the fence. And then kind of just what you just said there and what we've been talking about pushed me to be like, you know what, I, I think I am going to. Because number one, Standard, I think, is pretty fun right now. Sometimes Standard sucks, but right now it's actually in a really good place. I think they've done a good job of tuning it. Um, but but also, like, I felt, you know, aside from time and putting in the time and effort, which is not something, you know, it's, it's not, not a cost, but I don't have to spend any wild cards. I can just play the cards. I have all the cards necessary. So if, if that's something that you're worried about, that's just like, you know, the card acquisition, I think a lot of little limited players already kind of have access to that stuff. It's different, of course, if you want to get into Pioneer or Modern, uh, for example. The barrier of entry of spending several hundreds uh, of dollars on fetch lands and uh, and staples uh, that's of course uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a whole nother thing uh, and something that would have to be a more long-term investment um, but uh, for standard purposes arena is, is really a perfect place if you're a limited grinder yeah, to contrast what I was just saying about being like, oh, you know, I have all the cards for standard. Uh, two years ago, I think, or, you know, the, not the last Vegas MagicCon, but the one before the last one. So I guess the 2022 one, uh, it was a modern made event. And I thought, okay, you know, I, like, I, I don't usually, you know, go to a big event. So I would like to play in the main event. And it was not that I had all the cards. I had to talk to a bunch of friends and buy a few things and contact some people on Discord to get all the cards yeah. together. <laughs> so, you know, modern and eternal format, that's definitely the next step. And I don't think for most people, I wouldn't recommend that being your first step into Constructed. But the, the other good thing is like, you know, the Magic community, there's a lot of people you can reach out to. Like, you know, everybody listening might not have the same networks as you or I, but Often, if you have a few Magic friends who've been playing a while, like oh, a lot of people have these old cards, and I'm sure if you talk to people at your local game store, they don't mind borrowing or lending you cards for decks they're not playing. So if that is another barrier to entry, I think there are ways around it, especially without spending money. I think there are ways to acquire and share cards, and then you can do the same too, right? I know a lot of yeah. local game stores have like a little group where they kind of just like, okay, well, here's five people that we know play these modern and older formats. I'm using these cards this weekend. You can use them next weekend. So that's another way to kind of just ease the the cost, the barrier to entry. Yeah, like we we have so we have a group chat for the local game store uh, where I live, and uh, it's super inclusive. And it, basically, everyone has two, maybe three decks for each format. So if you don't have a deck, you can just ask. Someone will borrow you a deck, or if you want to try. A new deck out uh, for for example um, for pioneer I was interested in in mono white aggro going like uh, going from uh, playing 
just is it phoenix to maybe getting another deck and i got to try it and i really liked it and that like let me try something that i maybe otherwise wouldn't have gotten into but yeah there there uh, there is all there are always cards and sometimes whole decks to borrow i i even got to borrow a legacy deck for a tournament once and i i was kind of, i was kind of almost scared to <laughs> to <laughs> to borrow it because it, it it was like this is uh i've never held this much money in my hands <laughs> yeah, you're, doing, you're doing the carefulest shuffling of your life right yeah. just like i don't want to don't wanna nick those dual lands in there <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so just so you can brag a little bit here and give a little bit of cred to what we're about to say <laughs> um i think it'd be good just to hear like your accomplishments and constructed you haven't been playing your and years and years it's like some people but even in the short time that you've been playing you've, you've accomplished quite a bit yeah i i got into constructed like just before the pandemic but i have now post pandemic with with the uh, with all of the rcq starting up again mm-hmm. i i have several top eights to my name uh and i've established myself uh as one of the players to beat in my area of sweden at least nice. i have one rcq win i was in uh, sofia to play the rc here or in 2022 it's 2024 now now um, <laughs> <laughs> yep so so i've played one rc and uh i've also qualified for what's basically the swedish equivalent of the the scg invitationals Mm. so there's been like an scg tour series over the past the past year or so and uh, there's no set date yet but there will be one uh one very like masters tournament Mm. uh adjacent that i've qualified for after uh, after top aiding the last invitational tournament uh, in that series um i went eight two and one in the swiss portion uh, of that invitational that was modern pioneer and draft but uh, as i've said to many people if you want to know how to uh, top eight a tournament I, I can tell you how to do that. If you want to win tournaments, don't ask me. I, I have no clue. I have no clue. I have no clue how you get past the uh, the quarterfinals. <laughs> Honestly, when it comes to the high level magic, like a top eight is almost as good as a win. Like, uh, of course, in the payouts, the winning is, is way, way better yeah. than top eight. But as far as skill, like you always hear this from uh, pro tour competitors or it's like, you know, how many, you know, when they, when they did the, the Hall of Fame back when that was a thing. It was never yeah. how many wins did the person have? Number one pro tour wins is how many top eights did the person have? Yeah. That's really, I think you iron out the variance of like, okay, well, you made it a top eight. Of course, there's going to be a bunch of variants in the top eight because you've got these excellent players playing against each other that yeah. basically have like a 50 50 chance of winning. Matchups really matter, right? Just like what deck you're playing versus their deck. You're, you might be totally unfavored against your uh, your quarterfinals opponent. Don't make it to yeah. the semis. And, you know, that kind of stuff can happen. But yeah, great. No, I, I'm, I'm happy you shared that with us. Um, and also, this, that's a lot of events. And one of the things that I think is like a little bit of uh, something that constructive players have over limited players is they have more cool events that they can qualify for and go to. Whereas limited, we feel very lucky. It's like, oh, there's a competitive limited event. But uh, the constructive ones, I feel like just happen every weekend. Oh, yeah, for sure. There are a ton of constructed tournaments, especially modern tournaments um around here where i live modern is the by far the most popular format okay so just before we hop into the things that constructed can teach limited players it's it's this you know this podcast is not just about converting limited players to constructed it's also about if you are just a limited player the things that if you do dip into constructed once in a while well you can bring back to your limited games because right now myself i am a i'd say like 80 20 percent limited constructed player and i think that's probably a good place to be if you're just looking to take some of the lessons from constructed and bring them into limited you can apply that yeah. anybody can apply that a little bit of constructed on the side during your lunch hour you know that's, that's yeah. generally when i play <laughs> my constructed games um and and just before we get into those like things that you can bring uh into your limited game from constructed just want to leave you with some resources uh that if you are looking to make that jump that you can look at because unlike limited where there's a bunch of draft guides and podcasts i mean there's podcasts that they're for constructed too but i i actually find for whatever reason limited podcasts are a bit more like 
didactic they're a bit more uh, education based and i feel like constructed podcasts are a little more just like shooting the shit talking to, to each other <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, about- <laughs> and that's fine too nothing nothing wrong with that style of podcast but onboarding to these can to these formats can be a little bit trickier so what are some resources that that you've used to onboard yourself for my sake it's like if you go by websites just looking up deck lists and finding like the deck that you would like uh, to play uh i look a lot at mtg goldfish mtg top eight reddit and such like for just deck lists uh there are also of course uh videos like Mm. there are a ton of youtubers playing specific decks twitch streams uh if you if you want to (laughs) see if you want to see the spiciest decks then just go you have to go no further than aspiring spike (laughs) yeah and uh, you know uh there are pros like uh andre mangucci he streams a ton of different decks as well um so uh those are always good and then of course uh the discords uh when you have found the deck that you want to play go to the discord there's the discord for every single constructed deck i guarantee it um and uh they are just extremely good resources there are sideboard guides there are people who will be willing to give you answer any and all questions and it's it's just great i uh i'm i'm active in in several uh different constructed discords and uh and they're all great they're all great yeah i think i think with uh constructed especially people really get attached to their decks and they really can you know there's a lot of people who play constructed because they love like the mastery of just a single deck and then you have all these people in that one discord who basically only play that deck in that format and you get all that knowledge from those people so that's if you once you found your deck i agree totally a great place to to uh, really get that nitty-gritty if yeah. you're just trying to find a deck that you like, yeah, like you said, I think you can just kind of browse Twitch streams or Google, uh, YouTube videos. Or I would also recommend like MTG Goldfish, MTG Top 8, both pretty good websites for just looking at all the decks in the format. And you can kind of just be like, oh, that red-white aggro deck, that appeals to me. Or that blue-white control deck, that's something I'd like to play. You know, just to give a, a lay of the land of the decks you, you might have options. All right, so let's move into the actual, the meat of this episode and the, the things that limited players can learn from Constructed. I think that if you're a limited player moving to or trying to play Constructed, it's actually a much easier transition than a Constructed player trying to learn Limited. Because I think as limited players, we have a good sense of just magic fundamentals because that's kind of our bread and butter. Just learning about card evaluation, what you should expect on different kind of cards, yeah, combat situations, how to use your mana most efficiently. Like all those fundamental things are the things we teach people about in Limited. And Constructed, sometimes you, you're playing decks where you don't care about combat at all. It's just like, why do I need to learn combat? So it's harder to transition the other way. But... What, in your opinion, are some things that we can take from Constructed and, and put into our limited game to be better limited players? From from Constructed, uh, taking to limited, I think the most important aspect is deck building. You can be top tier drafter, but if you don't know how to build your deck and use the cards that you have drafted, uh, you're not going to do very well. And Constructed decks are just that. They are constructed. Uh, They are constructed according to a certain plan. They are constructed with a a very clear goal in mind and built around certain synergies to make the deck as efficient and strong as possible. There can be very niche cards that essentially define a whole archetype. You were were talking about Amulet Titan, for example. The card Amulet of Vigor, uh, it's not very good in itself. Like... When when uh, a permanent enters the battle, if it would enter tapped, it and uh, you may untap it, uh, or you untap it. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's a one mana artifact, right? Yeah, it's, it's like it's a, it doesn't do much. <laughs> no, in and of itself, in in a general broad concept, it doesn't do very much. But when you combine it with bounce lands, getting several land drops every turn, 
that's when it gets super strong. Essentially acts as a repeatable ritual effect, get, netting you tons of mana uh, like right away. Especially when you have multiples, uh, like your single balance land now taps for four mana as, as soon as it comes into play. Uh, they get off to silly starts sometimes. Is what you have to have in mind when building your deck, even in, decks even in limited. Um, Let's see, uh, an example from recent sets, it, it, it doesn't have the same uh, top end as uh, an amulet might have, but a, a similar one mana artifact is the uh, single blue waterlogged hulk from, from LCI. It's like that in and of itself, like a one mana artifact tap mill a card uh, and then you can flip it. it it's not very good but once you have like graveyard synergies and the descend synergies and and all of that it becomes a pretty good role player in in your deck and recognizing when certain niche cards are good in your deck and when they're not is something that you can really learn from constructed because you can really see how how you maximize certain effects uh, when you look at constructed decks. Yeah, that's a really great point. And it's kind of funny that, you know, you listen to you describe it that way. I think I kind of evaluate limited cards in that way sometimes too, because, you know, there's definitely just the generically good cards. You can point to a, a good cheap removal spell and a braid or a, a great creature, a preening champion. And you're like, yeah, that's just going to be a good card. It, it doesn't take much analysis. But when you get to the cards that, aren't just generically good and look a little bit strange that waterlogged hulk that's a, a really great example because i remember looking at waterlogged hulk for the first time and seeing the mechanics of the, of the set crafting and descending and i i thought to myself this isn't a very good card but i can imagine a deck where this card's great in it like you really care about this end maybe you care about crafting as well the the specifics of LCI panned out that it, you know you weren't really caring about crafting and L and descend at the same time. But yeah. if that deck did exist, I think that card would be a pretty good playable in those decks. And I do still think I could construct a deck in LCI Limited that makes good use of the card. So I, I think when I look at bad cards in Limited or just like you know when first looking at the set, my mind doesn't go to oh I'm probably not going to play that ever. It goes to where would this be good? Like wh what what parameters have to be true? for this card to be a playable card. And if you yeah. can start thinking about cards like that, then you start to be able to pick up those weird cards in draft that are like, oh, this is actually really good in my deck. I, I, I can I can think of an even better uh, example is Dovin's Acuity uh, oh, yeah. from Ravnica <laughs> Allegiance. Like three, three mana enchantment, I think most people who have <laughs> listened listen to uh, uh lords of limited <laughs> know this card yeah because it's ethan's favorite card of all time three mana enchantment uh enters the battlefield you draw a card and you gain two life and when you cast an instant during your main phase uh you can return it to its owner's hand and that was one of the best like turtle cards you could ever have in that format specifically and you could just loop your deck with clear the mind uh three mana sorcery that shuffles your graveyard back into your deck and you draw a card and you could just loop your deck and you're <laughs> essentially you don't you didn't even need to deal combat damage your opponent would just deck before you did and that and that's another example of like how do you maximize a certain card that in and of itself is not amazing yeah clear the mind we've had a lot of cards like that like shuffle some number of cards back into your library and then draw a card and whenever i think of those cards i think of sam black sam black loves those kind of cards and it makes sense because sam drafts decks that he's gonna see all the cards in his deck basically just has a bunch of card draw and when you think of where would you want something like clear the mind well it's when you're gonna go through your deck very quickly and you're drawing a bunch of cards and you you plan to always get to the last five cards in your library and sam always drafts decks like that so it makes yeah. sense for him to like that kind of card because the decks he drafts are going to get to the game state very often where that kind of effect is relevant so i think if you evaluate cards a little bit more like that and a little bit less binary this is good this is bad you're going to be a better deck builder in both constructed and limited all right so what uh what else so aside from deck building what are some other skills or other uh, transferable things? From from limited to constructed to really point out how superior limited players are <laughs> to constructed players is combat. And, mm. and this this is the most important part, I think, 
uh, is that limited players are extremely good at combat math, planning out how to get to lethal through a series of attacks like chump attacks is something that I think most constructive players that have never played limited are very hesitant to do. And you know what? what one other thing I, I notice is I notice constructive players don't double block as much. I think limited players have that as a tool in their tool belt that, that they flex a little bit more. Not to say yeah. constructive players never do, but it's always in my mind like, oh, I could double block here or triple block or even put my entire team in front if I was playing around a specific card. I think constructive players don't take that line as often as, as a limited player might. Yeah, for sure. And, and and that is that is a strength that you should really take advantage of when you uh, start out in Constructed. That's kind of what I did. Like playing creature aggro decks that always essentially wins through combat damage. Great way to utilize your skills uh, that you have owned through your limited grinding. Like for example, in Modern, I have played Team of Rhinos since uh, the deck was possible to be played. Even before that, I was playing Rhinos with uh, As Foretold instead. The deck was not very good, uh, <laughs> but I have cast, uh, cast Rhinos, uh, made 4 force all the time. And that is a very combat-centric deck. Like, the go main goal of the deck is to cast Crashing Footfalls, one of the suspend sorceries that has no mana cost. So the way you can cast it is through Shardless Agent and through Violent Outburst, which are both three mana Cascade cards. Cascade, we, we know this mechanic. They tried to fix it with Discover. They failed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Geological Appraiser was banned, you know? Yeah, essentially you play Shardless Agent and you uh, your deck is constructed in a way that you will always hit Crashing Footfalls. And for three mana, you get 10 power, 10 toughness. And that is a two turn clock. Uh, <laughs> Yep. With, with nothing else on board. The part where you can really ut utilize your skills uh, as a limited player in that context is how should you attack? When should you attack? When should you not attack? When should you chump attack? Uh, and how should you plan out your turns in terms of combat damage? Because I've, I've had a lot of times surprised opponents with some of my attacks that I am very certain that if I just attack all here, I will lose two creatures, but for my next turn, uh, they will have absolutely no possible outs to another attack, even though it means that I lose half my board for essentially uh, what can look like no advantage. But as a limited player, you know that sacrificing your creatures for some extra damage can can absolutely be an advantage for you. Like, how many time, times have you not uh, chump attacked with your 2-2s two into 3-3s three because you had five creatures and the opponent has two? Even though two of your creatures die, you will have lethal next turn. And also the thing of double blocking. I've noticed people being very surprised in Modern when I just say I have three uh, Rhino tokens out, three 4-4s, four and I slam every single one in front of their uh three three or something they're just oh uh okay <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah they were maybe thinking uh well i'm gonna maybe they have a trampling creature or something and i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna fatal push your your rhino token and i'm gonna get you um because you're not going to block with uh, more toughness than or power that that's needed. Uh, but yeah, I, I am. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had that exact same gameplay experience in modern. Actually, the exact same thing where you know I my opponent's playing rhinos, and uh, they they're attacking. I, I have a two. I just you know just to give an example off the top of my head. I have a two two and a two three, and they're attacking yeah. with with just two two four four trampling rhinos. And uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I have a few more creatures too, but they're like, you know, we'll just say one, one small things, right? And uh, I'm thinking that attack a four, four into a two, two and a two, three, that doesn't really make sense to me. You know, my, yeah. my limited player combat trick mind goes off and I go, yeah, that's a bad trade. What, what's up with this? And I go, you know, I think this probably means they have an interaction spell. And so I triple block, quad block, you know, block with more things than I have to. And then they like, reluctantly cast their brazen borrower after yeah. combat and you still you still win the combat because you were thinking of that limited mindset so you know we've been saying here how limited players have that skill going constructed but i also think 
constructed is a good way to train your combat math brain. You know, you were saying lots of limited players have good combat math skills, but if you're just, you know, starting out, you feel like your combat math skills are not as good as they could be. I think there's a lot of decks you can play in constructed. And I've actually recommended to people that I've coached that are looking to get better at combat math, play these standard decks, put, pick these up. Um, you know, for, for some examples, some that you brought to the table in our show notes here, mono white humans, just like any mono white deck in a uh, constructed format, that's going to be really, really good for just in your face combat math. When should yeah. I attack? When should I block? When should I save this so that I can, you know, when should I not attack my two power creatures into their two toughness blockers? Because I want to wait until I draw a pump effect. You know, my all my swords will get plus one, plus one. Or yeah. uh, my siege veteran that puts counters on things and starts getting through. That kind of stuff. You can really train from the kind of the repetition that you yeah. face in Constructed. Because in some limited games, you know, of course they're about combat. But you're not always going to get put in tough combat situations. Sometimes you just are like, alright, I'm just playing my stuff and I curve out and I kill you. That happens in Constructed too. But since your deck is so focused on... I have this creature plan. I am going to pump my creatures. I'm going to buff them, anthem them. You're consistently facing these scenarios where you have to think about that combat math, thinking about planning turns ahead. So like in standard, mono white, mono red, Esper midrange is another pretty good one that's just very creature-based, very combat-focused. Um, and then you go to Pioneer, red, white, Convoke, which has uh, kind of been the hotness in the past little while. There's also a good mono white humans deck, like you mentioned. So I think in any constructed format, you're going to be able to find a good aggro deck. I mean, maybe, you know, go to Vintage Legacy, not so much. But, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> the kind of combat math you expect to see in Limited, you're going to see in most constructed formats. And I do think it's a good training ground. Yeah, for sure. I feel like I've learned a lot. Like, I haven't been playing Pioneer Mono White uh, as much, but that deck really, really puts pressure on you to plan out your combats uh, and really do the math especially when it comes to cards like you you have so so many different anthem effects uh in especially in pioneer with uh thalia's lieutenant and copper coat vanguard thalia's lieutenant uh puts counters on all of your other humans copper coat vanguard gives all of your uh other humans plus one plus oh you also have creature lands that can change combat math as well an example that that I have from an RCQ that was kind of made in limited a limited mindset was that I was playing against a player who had Lyra Dawnbringer in play, uh, five five flying life link first strike uh, on board, and um, maybe one other creature, and I had a substantial board, and I played Thalia's Lieutenant for turn to pump up my board, and I. And I decided to swing with the team. And I knew he was going to block my biggest creature, which was another Thalia's Lieutenant, with, which was a 4-4. He, he made the blocks that I expected him to do. And uh, as, as was, uh, my unblocked creatures would deal lethal damage. But of course, the Lyra Dawnbringer has lifelink. So how do, do we solve this problem? Well, for first strike damage resolves, I played Iganjo in my own lieutenant and killed it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, killed it. <laughs> yeah, so they don't get the lifelink. Yeah, very yeah, so they, yeah, so they don't get the lifelink, I get the lethal damage. I think that is a very limited thing to do. Yeah, and just before we move on to like the, the next point, leaving this combat math discussion behind... I think that it's kind of the our, our transition point in a way because, like you said, it's something that you're already good at as a limited player, but you can not only get better at it as you yeah. play more and more, but also it, it's it is an advantage that you're going to have over a lot of constructed players. So and you know the intimidation factor of getting into constructed, I would say, is lessened a little bit because there are those transferable skills where you're going to actually have some sort of an advantage over the, the constructed players that don't play limited. So just a little bit of, uh, you know, to ease your mind if you are like a little bit worried about making that jump. I think it's a little bit easier of a transition than, than a lot of people think. Okay, so what what else? What else do you think you can uh, bring from constructed to improve your limited game? When it comes to constructed, you are very aware of what's in your deck. And that is, that is something that I think you should generally be more aware of. What do you have in your deck when you're 
playing limited. Like there, there are those add-ons uh, or extensions. Uh, I've seen you use them. Uh, yeah, like sometimes. untapped, untapped. Yeah, un- yeah, untapped. That shows you what's left in your deck, and I think that it, that is a very reason, uh, very important skill to practice. Like your awareness of uh, your potential outs. Like how many outs do I have uh, in this situation? What cards can I draw to get out of this? And that's to motivate yourself, uh, essentially, to continue pushing through and maybe grind out a win that you maybe otherwise hadn't thought of. I, I love that. That That's actually, a real, I've never heard anybody phrase that way, but knowing what your outs are or thinking about them helps you push through. It, it helps you feel like you, you're not just like, well, game's over. Like my opponent's in a great spot. I, I guess I should scoop. No, it's it's actually the mo- the motivation to keep playing. I think that's such a great way to, to frame it. Yeah. With the easy access of games uh, on Arena, a lot of people scoop early. And I, I'm guilty of this myself. Like if I'm if I'm playing best of one and I'm like I'm like almost dead, like maybe my opponent can put me to one or something, or like I feel like I'm I'm kind of behind. I just eh, I'm just gonna scoop and go to the next game. I'll I'll win I'll win out from here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but when you're playing tournament magic, that that's that's not the case. Like you have a best of three game. Uh, or best of three match, and uh, that's it. Um, you have you have three games, and you need to win two. You don't. You can't just concede and try to win the next, and then win out from there. That's much much harder to do. So having an awareness of your potential outs uh, is very very good because I I know I have played games for maybe three or four turns longer than. I I would have if I wasn't aware of my potential outs in in some in some matchups because I know if I draw this card or this card uh, I this gives me a much greater chance to actually turn this game around and win um, and then you know sometimes you don't draw your outs and that's magic um, but uh, being aware of your potential outs can certainly improve your win rate so so that that that's a, that's some uh, a mindset i think that more constructed players have uh, than limited yeah. players no that's a good point yeah I, and and i think especially because so when you're playing constructed the, the range of your outs is smaller because you're playing multiple copies of a bunch of cards right like your deck is bigger but i yeah. think you have like you have fewer unique cards in your constructed decks than you do in your limited decks, right? Mm-hmm. So you're just like thinking about, okay, here's like the three or four cards I could draw. I have three or four, I have, you know, two or three copies of each of those left. In limited, I think it's actually harder to play to your outs a lot of the time because your yeah. decks are a little bit, you, you know, when you think about it in, in constructed, your outs, it's usually like, okay, I need just one more pump effect, one more Thally as your lieutenant, you're playing that mono white deck, yeah. one more, just pump my four and I'll be able to, like, I shouldn't block here because if I draw one of those next turn, I'll be able to kill them on the crack back, right? Yeah. But in, in limited, it's not as straightforward as that. Usually it's like, well, I have some combat tricks, but what combat tricks actually get me over the finish line? Oh, this aerial boost that, you know, gives my creature flying, that does it, but this other combat trick won't. So you actually do have to really either have one of those trackers to, you know, look at what cards you have left, or take a screenshot of your deck, or look on 17 lands. And especially if you are somebody who maybe drafts, you know, two, three times a day, the decks start to run together, yeah. right? And you're like, <laughs> you're like, well, was it this deck that I had that removal spell in? Or is it the, like, I actually don't remember here. And, and so I really do, when I, with, whenever I'm playing a competitive limited event, I make sure I, I'm looking at my deck a lot of the time. Like, yeah. I have a screenshot. I don't just have the tracker, which I think is helpful, but remembering yeah this is the deck that has two burn spells that can go to the face or yeah. this is the deck that actually doesn't have a lot of ways to close the game so i should take the the slightly less aggressive line here because i put them to two but how what am i going to do after that like i have no way to to get them down to zero after i've thrown away my board so that's it's another i think kind of in-between skill where it but it goes the other way where with the combat math limited players are better at it but you can get better at it by playing constructed. I yeah. think with playing to your outs, constructed players are better at it, but playing your limited decks, you can train that just as well. Yeah. And uh, and like knowing your deck is is also a skill uh, that 
especially constructed players uh, are in tune to like deck uh, deck expertise uh, often wins out against like how well positioned the deck is in the overall meta game like um for once again for example reed duke uh like he he is touted as the jund master mm-hmm. or for example andrea mangucci who is a phenomenal uh blue red murktide player uh in in uh, in modern like the blue red murktide deck has not put up very good results uh, in the big tournaments lately but you see mangucci do well with it uh consistently uh like all the time because he is an expert in yeah. that deck uh and like the skill of the deck pilot really matters mm-hmm. uh in constructed uh, and i think i think it does in limited as well because i think for myself i uh, i can pilot a generic aggro deck much much better than the average player Right. Like I have confidence in myself that if I have an aggressive deck, I will be able to maximize its potential with or without the like game breaking bombs. I will, I will be able to like eke out the wins because I am proficient in playing aggro decks. Uh, however, I'm not as proficient in, with playing control decks and I am sure that I have like fumbled away wins uh, that maybe I shouldn't have because I'm not as in tune to should I counter the spell or should I let it go? Um, I'm more in tune to the <laughs> should I attack here or not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, like, know, knowing knowing your deck and essentially in, in limited knowing your archetype, uh, knowing knowing your deck in the sense that what is the what is the game plan uh, of the deck uh, is also a skill uh, that you can. Uh, apply from constructed to limited uh, like try it, it, it's of course hard to get the same deck <laughs> all the time in limited mm-hmm. that's just not how it works but no know, knowing uh, your game plan and your deck yeah and just to you know you got this list of, of things that we're going to get to here just we're banging them out here some of these skills but just to jump ahead to one of the ones that's a little bit later on this list here you also say learn your deck but equally important to know what your opponent's doing and, and i think that that is another skill that constructed players are much more in tune with than limited yeah. players. You know, like constructed players, they it's a little easier to approach because there's a meta. You know, yeah. there's like these four, five, six, seven, eight decks you're expecting to see in your given format. But in limited, it works too, right? It's not as pointed where it's just gonna be like, I know they're playing blue white. They're gonna have these exact cards, but you know the general game plan of what a blue white deck is gonna want in each format. Maybe it's a little more aggressive. Maybe it's a little more controlling and yeah. Different formats. And I think a little too often people get a little too hyper focused on what their deck is doing, how they want to play their cards, and that's good. You you want to get that stuff right at first. Yeah. Like if you get that stuff wrong, it's you're gonna have a, a big <laughs> problem. But once you kind of have a handle on that stuff. I would really, really encourage thinking about why your opponent's doing the thing. You know, it's the stuff we talk about all the time. This is not new information, but in just in the context of applying it to Constructed, thinking about what your opponent's doing. Why do they do the thing they're doing? What is their deck trying to do? If their deck is slower, what does that mean for me? Should I be more aggressive here? Should I, you know, burn my removal spell when I when they might have, like, a very notable five drop in the format that i know needs a removal spell and they're in that color pair and that's the golden common other color pair i maybe should have saved it for that because i have the knowledge that that might be coming all of those things so do you have, like just speak to that for a second and how do you kind of gauge what your opponent's doing and how you want to uh you know change your game plan based on that in both yeah. constructed and limited yeah like in in limited i think a very important uh, thing to consider uh during gameplay is why did my opponent draft these colors? There, like, there must be a reason that they drafted the colors that they did, and that leads you to assumptions of what they, uh, what cards they have put in their deck. My my first thought here is like, uh, if my opponent in in, uh, in LCI is playing blue white, uh, I'm assuming that they have uh, the the five mana blue. Uh, blue white are a signpost on common the master's mural 
Uh, I forget yeah. the name. Yeah, Master's yeah. Guide Mural. Yeah, Master's Guide Mural, uh, for example, because that is a pull into blue-white. If, they, if they're playing green-red, I'm assuming that they at some point will cast Firstborn of uh, Yeshoth, uh, Isquinth. Oh, yeah, Isquinth, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming they will cast that at some point, so that's at, in the back of my mind. And if my opponent is playing like some subpar cards in a color that has some game-breaking bomb, uh, I'm having that in the back of my mind because your opponent is going to be a logical person uh, 99% of the time. <laughs> At <laughs> least you have... should give them the credit of that, yes. right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like you should give you should give them some form of credit uh, when it comes to like their deck construction. So if they're if they're playing like red subpar cards, I'm thinking of Bonehorde Dracosaur. Like I am assuming that they have something like that because why would they otherwise play these subpar cards if they don't have something to uh, outweigh that that they have some subpar uh, cards. So that's something that I have in mind, and also something that in constructed. Um, you can have in mind, for example, if you're playing against uh, a Yawgmoth deck in Modern uh, and the opponent uh, just plays out their Yawgmoth from, uh, on an essentially empty board. That is a pretty bad play <laughs> overall. Right. Uh, like Yawgmoth, you want to have multiple creatures in play uh, so you can sack them, draw cards, and, and combo off. Uh, but if they play their Yawgmoth on a mostly empty board, you can suss out that they probably have another Yawgmoth in, in hand uh, or that they have a quarter calling, <laughs> for example. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have you in hand yeah. <laughs> uh, and have some other way to like search it up. Uh, so those, those kinds of plays can be telling. Or, um, for example, when I pass the turn, uh, when I play Team Rhinos and I have three mana open, uh, my opponent is going to assume that I have Violent Outburst. That is just uh, the way you suss out your opponent's, uh, your opponent's plans. Uh, and that is why it's, it's important to know what your opponent is up to as well. Yeah, right, right there, I think, is a good point to kind of that you can tie into limited you, you you know your opponent's deck you know if your opponent's playing team or rhinos they're not playing like counter spells like sometimes when you pass the turn or your opponent passes the turn you're like oh they might have a counter spell here yeah and of course you might think that if you never like you see this like team or mana base some some blue mana in there you've never played against this deck before and you're like oh it could be a counter spell maybe i should play around this right but if you know the deck of course you know that this deck isn't going to like i mean it has force negations and stuff like that yeah uh, so it, it might here and there, but most likely when they pass the turn, the, the turn on turn three, they're going to cast one of their cascade cards. Like that's yeah. kind of their game plan. And for limited, I think you can apply the same thing too. So like right now in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, we have some pretty aggressive blue decks, right? Blue, red, pirate aggro. Like that's a very yeah. much attacking blue deck. You know, some of the white blue decks can be a little more attacking than, you know, not, not really so much the crafting late game stuff. And if your opponent is playing a fast deck and they, they pass the turn with open mana, I would assume it's something other than a counter spell. I wouldn't play around yeah. a counter spell if my opponent's playing an aggro deck. Maybe they have a flash creature. Maybe they have a removal spell or a, a needle, right? The the lodestone needle taps something yeah. down. Because your aggro decks, most people won't put counter spells in aggro decks, right? Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing you can kind of logic out. Like, what could they be holding up? What could they be representing? What would make sense for them to be representing, given yeah. what their deck is doing? Yeah, for sure, and and that that is a skill you learn over time, especially in constructed. Uh, like you you learn how uh, other decks are constructed, uh, what uh, what cards they can represent with what kind of mana. I've caught myself and my opponent out uh, at some points with uh with assuming that they have one thing or like making the unexpected play i know at one point my, i was super sure that my opponent had a counter spell for uh for my cascade but i realized well he doesn't have two blue open and i'm pretty sure if he had a counter it would be counter spell like blue blue uh he doesn't have that and mm -hmm. um and then I thought, well, it's probably safe to cast this Cascade spell then. And my opponent 
went for his hand and like almost started to cast <laughs> cast his spell and then looked at his lands and realized <laughs> that he had he didn't have blue blue open that's great well yeah <laughs> not even playing around the opponent like intentionally doing something you yeah just, like, you just use that logic to come to the logical play yeah in a way that was just based on your thinking about it it wasn't based yeah. on pattern recognition which yeah that's yeah. That's, that's a really great uh, example and, and so you know we have a, a few here that I, I you brought a bunch of these points to the table i have a few that i want to just bang out um yeah. as we get to the tail end of the podcast here and you know tell me you can finish up on any last thoughts that you have but some things that i thought of when i think of okay the, the skills that you can transfer number one I, I we've kind of touched on this but i think constructed gives you more reliable and replicable feedback than limited. And what I mean by that is if you're doing something right in your constructed deck or wrong in your constructed deck, you're going to get good feedback on that a little bit better than if you're playing a limited deck. Cause number one, you get to have more reps with that constructed yeah. deck and you really feel I'm leveling up. I'm getting better. By the time you get a feel for your limited deck, the draft might be over. You, you might've lost three times or you might've trophied. So there's not all that much you can learn as it, uh, as you're playing it. There's a, or I should say there's a limited amount that you can learn, no pun intended, where with Constructed, you get more feedback, more consistent feedback. And because your deck is more consistent, it's, it's got you know multiple copies of the same card, you get into like this kind of the same game state, same play patterns that more often than you would in Limited. So I think if yeah. you're just looking to train that intuition, just that magic turn to turn what you're supposed to do intuition, Constructed really helps with that because... If you're looking to get that skill from limited, I think it takes a lot more drafts to get a feel for it. Like, I think if I'm trying to practice for a constructed format, it takes fewer reps to get just the general feel of the format yeah. compared to limited, where I think you have to draft a bunch of different decks and figure out how the play patterns go. It's a little slower in that way. Yeah, I, I, I would say you need maybe 20 drafts yeah. to, to get the feel of a limited set. You need 20 games <laughs> to, right. to, to figure out how a constructed format feels or yeah. how it works yeah because uh, you usually will get a good spread of opponents you know on you know a bunch of different archetypes and of course you can see how that matches up and what your yeah. good matchups are and what your bad matchups are where you tend to lose where you tend to win every time you know you can really like clock yeah. that kind of stuff yeah yeah exactly i've been playing some mono mono white humans in standard lately and i didn't really know what my matchup against the toxic deck uh, looked like mm -hmm. but i've faced it a couple times on on the ladder recently and i think i am four and oh uh against the toxic deck nice. so now i know that my matchup is very likely good <laughs> 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 against that deck and that is very hard to like suss out in just four matches uh in a limited format to know whether uh an archetype or something how an archetype matches up against another archetype uh actually looks like or how it actually plays out yeah a next point i have here is constructed often gives you an example of the vision right that you're building towards like lots of limited decks are modeled after constructed decks you have yeah. mono red aggro and constructed where we don't usually get mono red aggro and limited but you can go one step up to be like a boros aggro deck like we were talking about where yeah. you, a lot of the same principles apply um, and even though it's a little bit different, you can still see in the constructed deck, like that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming for as many ones and twos as you possibly can. You're looking for the ways yeah. to push damage. So, especially when it comes to cube, you, you a lot of your cube decks are ex like expressly modeled after constructed decks. It's like you're trying to replicate the constructed experience by drafting this kind of deck. You're drafting a storm deck, a tinker deck, whatever it is, right? And, and I think that. If you're looking for an example of what a good mid-range deck looks like, what a good, especially mid-range. Mid-range is always that big question of limited players head, like, what exactly is mid-range? Because it's a little yeah. bit confusing. <laughs> I love pointing to, like, black-green mid-range decks in standard where you've got, you know, the the Mosswood Dread Knights and yeah. Cottages, these lands that give you value and your shielders, you're just grinding out. Everything's a two-for-one. You're playing this attrition game, but you're not control, really, right? It's not like yeah. a control deck. And, and I think that, the best way I could explain what a mid-range deck is to somebody is just show them that kind of deck. So I think if you're looking for that vision, looking for examples of what your limited deck should aspire to be, what you're trying to build towards, and 
almost push in an extreme direction because a lot of times yeah limited players can get caught a little too much in the middle they're not doing an aggro thing they're not doing a controlling thing they're just like here are my cards where i would fix those decks by giving them some sort of direction pushing one direction to the other and i think without those models of constructed decks it's hard to know where you're supposed to push what kind of card types you're supposed to include so constructed can clue you into that kind of stuff yeah, for sure, for sure. Like knowing when to put a counter spell in your deck and when to not do that is, is like that. That is certainly something that uh, constructed can help you do. Yeah, and then my my last point here before I send back over to you to Pat to wrap us up is just planning turns. You know, I think in I, I always talk about how to plan your turn. Now, well, actually, I don't talk about it a ton in limited, but in, in constructed, planning out your turns is so critical to success. Honestly, because you have so many more things you can do in constructed. Usually your your cards are a little more complex. You usually have more options of what you can cast in a given turn. Cause in limited, it's like, okay, I play my two on two. I play my three on three, but in constructed where the, the costs of cards are generally cheaper, leaning a little more towards the one, two, three mana slots. Yeah. That just means there's more different permutations of cards. You could play. You could cast yeah. your three drop, you cast your two drop and your one drop. You cast your three one drops or, you know, cast your two drop and crack your blood token. Like so many little things you can do. And planning out your turn beforehand is something that you're really, really incentivized to do in Constructed. Yeah. And limited you are too. If you have to, you all, a lot of times the decisions are simplified for you. But in Constructed, not only are your turn to turn actions a little bit more complicated, but because the deck plans are a little like because the deck plans are more solid in exactly what their roles are it's not like limited where you're going back and forth once in a while you know on turn four you want to do this thing on turn five you have to anticipate your opponent doing that so it's not just planning your turn each turn it's thinking about future turns and yeah. as and it's not that this stuff isn't relevant and limited it just comes up a little less often and because it comes up less often you're going to train that skill not as well as you would in constructed. So I think constructed is a great training ground for training that skill, even though it doesn't come up as much as limited. When it does come up, you'll have that tool in your toolbox. Yeah, and if you really want to learn how to sequence your turns, I I recommend playing Is It Phoenix in, oh, yeah. in Pioneer, <laughs> because that deck is sequencing 101, uh, maybe 102. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, because. It, that the deck is built around dark light phoenix you need to cast three spells on uh, before combat to actually get them back from the graveyard uh you also need to balance like getting enough cards uh in the graveyard for your treasure cruises um and how to sequence your cantrips uh in an optimal way and when to when to discard your phoenixes when to when to play your Ledger Shredder on two without triggering it, and when to play it on turn three to then have a cantrip to trigger it immediately, um, even though uh, maybe the Shredder would have blocked an opposing creature um, or if you played it on turn two. Um, it, it's a it's a really good way to to practice your your sequencing um, because you have a lot of cheap spells uh, and a lot of cards that really really force you and require you to have sequenced your spells beforehand uh, and you're also with cantrips you're inherently sculpting your hand for future turns so I think I think that is a very good deck to practice that skill absolutely yeah so just to wrap us up here any any last comments thoughts or points we didn't get to anything you wanted to cover mulligans mulligans mm. like limit limited players there's nothing there's nothing more limited players hate than mulliganing <laughs> <laughs> yeah if 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 you if you uh if you tell a limited player you need to mulligan that hand they they will not want to mulligan the hand the only thing harder than convincing a limited player to to mulligan is is convincing the a limited player that they need to play 17 lands and not <laughs> <laughs> yeah can i get this land no no you probably shouldn't <laughs> no but yeah mulliganing in constructed is a very important skill to know when to mulligan and when to not mulligan like what hands uh, work well in a certain matchup and which don't when you feel confident about which hands you can keep in, in certain matchups, that that is indicative of, of when you have when you have become proficient in a deck. And like 
um, for for example, I'm taking Team Rhinos as an example always because that's the deck I always play. Mm-hmm. Um, like I mulligan, uh, I mulligan hands with three lands and four spells all the time because they don't have a cascade spell. And my limited mindset is telling me, well, this is three lands and four spells. Of course, right. I'm going to keep it. Uh, <laughs> but the hand is not conducive to my game plan, so I need to mull again. Or my hand does not match up with the uh, uh, with the opponent's game plan. Like maybe I have a I have a hand with um, three lands and um, three cascade spells and uh, a force of negation, but my opponent is playing Yogmoth. So that hand is not going to cut it because I'm not doing anything to interact with my opponent with their mana dorks like uh, or anything. And the force of negation is essentially already a dead card because they're not playing that many non-creature spells your range of keepable hands in limited are usually wider Mm -hmm. like three lands four spells is almost always a keep in limited like there are a few (laughs) few three land for uh, four spell hands that are are actually a mulligan in in limited but there are several in constructed right and i would add on to that that once you know in limited what your your matchup is like it's like in best of three you should mulligan according to that. So yeah. you're you're in the dark. Totally, exactly what you said. Hundred percent agree. You're gonna keep most three land, four spells, four spells, three land. Like you know, vice versa. You're gonna keep those yeah. hands. But then you get to game two, and you know you're facing a really fast aggro deck. You can't really keep a hand if you have three lands, four spells, but your first spell is turn three. Yeah. Right. Like you probably have to mulligan that hand. So the the concepts of the knowing what you need, knowing what is acceptable as a keep. Yeah. That still really applies to limited, especially when you already are you've played a game, you know what the game, you know what the matchup's like, you know what you kind of need. I think that's a good point to just wrap things up on. I think we covered quite a bit here. Um, yeah, I kind of already asked, but do you have uh, any any last thing you want to leave with us? And if not, I'll just say thanks for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I really, I really want to shout out. Um... If you listen to this podcast, I'm assuming you want to listen to other podcasts, maybe. Mm. I really want to shout out the Dive Down uh, Mm. as a constructed podcast. They're great. Uh, They talk about many different formats. They're they're super fun to listen to. They have a great dynamic. Um, So... Uh, if you're not too averse to me plugging another pod, <laughs> no, 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 please. Yeah. yeah, I'm all about pointing people in the right direction just to reach their goals in magic. And if, if some other piece of content, especially constructive focus podcast content, can get them there, then yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, and their Discord is great as well as a general constructed um, Discord, like not deck specific. Nice. Um, so, uh, the dive down that that is a really great resource to to listen to and a good starting point to diving into <laughs> constructed <laughs> yeah i mentioned at the top that i felt like constructed podcasts were a little bit less structured a little bit less focused on the education but i do know yeah. dive down definitely is in the same vein of like a you know a little bit of level ups uh limited yeah. resource style thing yeah and they they have like they have general uh, discussion episodes they have deck specific episodes and yeah so uh, I, I I do really recommend them. Sweet. Well, we'll wrap it up from there. Everybody, thank you so much for listening and watching. Hope you, uh, you know, maybe this has convinced you to play a little bit more constructive here and there. And yeah, we'll see you next time on the next episode of Limited Level Ups. Bye, everybody. Yeah.